Mm-hmm. Can you hear? Hare Krishna Maharaj. I'm in New York, just arrived recently from Europe. I am trying to get an understanding of how things were back in the beginning. Maharaj, you were the devotee who found 26 Second Avenue for Srila Prabhupada, and you also signed the incorporation papers. What was it like in those days? How was it that day to sign the incorporation paper? I, I, I did sort of think it was my a duty to do. I was kind of doing it uh, almost blindly, like thinking that, well, maybe I was doing a good thing. And there was a, there was a little glimmer of, of uh, maybe, maybe it was going to, to be important because I thought Prabhupada was very pure and all that. But I, I just I didn't really have a, a clear idea of where it was going to lead. I just did it because there was nothing else to do. And I'm, I'm, I'm totally convinced that if I hadn't been there at that time, it would have happened anyway. If it would have been someone else who would have done it. So, so I kind of feel that a little bit um, uh, uh, out of the picture that I was just there, that I just happened to be there because it was a bit of good luck or something like that. But I don't think I realized anything about its momentous nature or that it would be celebrated, you know, in years to come. It's how did it take place, and what did the others think about it? Um, well, what what happened was someone brought the papers over to where I was living, and I didn't really know what was going on. I just thought, well, this is this is a something that has to be done, so I just signed them. I thought well, I didn't think that, that there was anything particularly important or necessarily important to me that I would be signing these papers, but I signed them because I mean I I, I just very cursively. Uh, read them. I didn't read them very thoroughly. I just just kind of like scanned them, and it all kind of made sense. And I I, I didn't don't know what other people were thinking, but uh, I, I signed the papers, and, and that was that. And it was just all done very quickly and in my place. So I don't know what was going, what other people happened to think about it. I was just just kind of honored that I was chosen to sign the papers. But on the other hand, I didn't know really what it was. I just thought it was something that I had to do. Looking back and looking at where we are now, how do you feel about the growth of Iskun? I thought that uh, it wasn't really going to go anywhere or amount to very much. I, I didn't, didn't, certainly didn't think it would end up 50 years later uh, as a, as a uh, presentation in the Sydney Opera House, for one thing, or on a, on a boat ride in, 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 in uh, near Boston in a, in a big um, sort of boat i didn't didn't have any any of that kind of uh notion that, that it was going to grow into something very uh, momentous and, and very uh very big and what about the seven objectives well, i kind of read through them and I, I saw what they were and and i just thought well that, it all makes a lot of sense and uh you know it was a little bit esoteric because i didn't know what the bhagavatam was at that time i sort of knew what it was but i just didn't didn't uh think think ahead very much i just thought well this is something I had to do. I had, like I said, I had a glimmer of hope that this was something that I, that was really worthwhile doing. Sort of in the mode of goodness, you know, you, you, you do things that you think are, are, are right and, and good for people, but not necessarily, you know, going to amount to anything very, very big. And uh, it all, it all made a lot of sense. The, the, the idea of bringing people close together and uh, et cetera, and, 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 and publishing, which was not being done at that time. But I think there, there's an old, old, uh, old uh, cyclist style or mimeograph machine that, that there was some, some duplication going on, some printing. What do you think Srila Prabhupada's vision for ISKCON New York was? Uh, I think, I mean, I didn't then think this way, but I think now that, uh, that he must have had some sort of uh, greater vision. For one thing, he, he was insistent on the, the fact that, that ISKCON be incorporated. And that was a, an indication that he was looking to the future uh, at a time when, when, when he and all the other people would cease to exist in this body. And, uh, but he also knew that New York City and the United States would probably still exist, so, so incorporated there and, uh, and, and uh, observed the culture of succession manifesting. Um, on the other hand, he has, I've heard him say in lectures that he didn't think it, it would ever amount to what it became. So although he had a vision for the future uh, that, that uh, was way beyond what I thought at the time, um, and, and there's the story of, of him saying that he could foresee many temples and so on and so forth, um, he did have some vision of the future, even though he said he wasn't planning it. it, it just, it's just one of those things that, that grew and grew and, and happened. 
you were not in New York for long, right? So you were not there at Tompkins Square Park. I think Prabhupada moved into um, into 26 Second Avenue in June or May or June of, of uh, 1966, and uh, I, I went. I I I, I uh, was part of a drive-away car adventure adventure. And, and that took place in, I think, October or November of 1966. So as things were getting underway in New York, I was I was on my way to California. I was in uh, sort of correspondence with Prabhupada, and he sent me a letter, and in the letter was a clipping from the New York Times of him chanting. It had a picture of the devotees chanting in Tompkins Square Park, and it had a quotation or a couple of sentences from Allen Ginsberg. And at that time, I kind of realized for the first time that it was just just an older Swami from India um, speaking from from a Sanskrit book, but that uh, what what he had started became something of a popular movement, and it was at that time that I sort of had this realization, uh, not completely. I, I wasn't really seeing into the future, but I thought it was more than just a small thing, just to just a, a few lectures given at 22nd. 20, uh, 26 Second Avenue. So, but for the most part, what I was doing was was what I thought was was uh, interesting, adventurous, and fun. Not not that I was like a serious missionary trying to to uh, spread the the uh, the the, uh, the movement that Lord Chaitanya started 500 years ago. I just did it because it was the thing to do for me. It was the, I enjoyed it, and and so it was kind of like. Uh, in the, I was in the spirit of enjoyment. Let's let's put it that way. I wasn't really in the in the spirit of propagating a mission. And even when I, uh, it probably took me a, a year or a year and a half from the time that I first uh, met Prabhupada and got initiated that I that I felt like I could be uh, a missionary. That I really got into the spirit of of uh, you know fighting against Maya and and uh, propagating Krishna consciousness. It took me about a year to a year and a half. Even though I was very convinced that philosophically it was correct, but I, I didn't feel like I was really an integral part of the the forward forward march of Krishna consciousness at that time. What about the future? The main thing I, I would like to say is that w what's happened in the last 50 years is kind of miraculous, and what's going to happen in the next 50 years is probably also going to be miraculous. So I think people should just just. Uh, uh, hunker down and, and uh, chant their rounds and, and, and read Prabhupada's books as much as possible and, um, and, and follow the regulated principle as Prabhupada approved of it. Purity is the force. Prabhupada approved of this saying, purity is the force. And I think the next 50 years will also be very momentous and unpredictable, just like the first 50 years were. So I would just say to the New York devotees to, to, to know that they're in, in safe hands. And that if, as long as they do uh, what Prabhupada desired us to all to do, uh, that uh, that uh, that force will carry us into the future in a in a very glorious way. We would love some advice from you, Maharaj. I, I think that uh, uh, there's four words that are, that are most important here, and that is purity is the force. And I think if if we're strict about what we wear and wearing tilak devotional clothes as much as possible and um, uh, and, and as I say to a lot of devotees it's very important you should I mean even even like strict followers you know they're not necessarily strict but I, I advise them to read every day at least 30 pages of Prabhupada's books that's a very important thing and and to, to follow their their initiation vows and to chant 16 rounds as part of the vows and I, I think that if all those things people you know are followed and and uh, They go to the morning programs and they use their intelligence at the same time they will be very successful there's a story that goes like this and it really happened it's not just a story it's an incident um, it has to do with Giri Raj Swami and Prabhupada Giri Raj Swami was in Prabhupada's room in, in 1977 it was just before Prabhupada departed from this planet and he said so Prabhupada I just wanted to ask you if we Uh, chant our rounds and follow the regular principles and go to the morning program will everything be all right he was kind of like you know trying to think about what how his con would go on without Prabhupada. and he heard Prabhupada say yes and then as he was 
to walk out, he heard Prabhupada say behind his back, and use your intelligence and organization. And then I asked Giri Raj if that actually happened, and he said yes. Those are the ex exact words that he used, use your intelligence and organization. So I think that in addition to uh, reading and chanting and going to the program and, and uh, you know, uh, following initiation vows, it's important to think uh, and organize clearly. Think on our, think on our feet and, and not be lazy. Just just always be, be ready to adjust the philosophy to time, place, and, and audience or circumstance. And at the same time, be very strict on oneself in terms of, you know, following initiation vows, and reading regularly, I, I really think that's what's going to to uh, keep us pure and and for things to go forward in in a, in a very unpredictable way, but but in, in a, you know in a very way in a way that's faithful to what Lord Chaitanya had envisioned and predicted. Give me of, of, of his movement. Srila Prabhupada came to Brooklyn. Please, can you share a story from Henry Street? One of the things that, that it's not exactly a story, but. Um, I remember going in, into uh, Prabhupada's presence in, in the Brooklyn Temple, and that even though it's over a subway, I think it's the A train that goes underneath there, and the, the whole building would rumble when when the train would would go underneath, and uh, to somehow sitting in, in Prabhupada's presence in that room created a kind of peaceful and rural atmosphere, even though it was in the midst of a very thriving, busy uh, part of of the world, New York, Brooklyn. Uh, that, that, that whenever I was in Srila Prabhupada's presence, there was that, that feeling of, of uh, tranquility that, oh, that, that came over me. No matter where he was or what he was doing, he just, it just exuded, the, he created an atmosphere of tranquility and, and peace and calm and, and uh, stillness that wasn't there otherwise. Thank you so much, Maharaj. My pleasure. Well, I sort of felt like, I mean, I, it, it has to do with how I feel at the present moment. I feel sort of like there was a guy named uh, Juan Garcia, who was a, a counter spy during World War II. And he got the, uh, he was like a counter spy. The Germans thought he was spying on the British, and the British thought he was, and the British uh, contracted him to spy on the Germans. So, but he got the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, Iron Cross from the Germans, which is a, a very high award for uh, military service. And, he, and in, in England, who he was really working for the British people, they gave him the award called NBE or OBE, Member of the British Empire or Member uh, or, or Order of the British Empire, Distinguished Order. And, and uh, they, they made a video of him called Garbo. Garbo was his code name uh, assigned to him in England, named after the actress Greta Garbo because he... he uh, he fictionalized a lot of stories that the German people believe, and uh, he's noted for uh, for <clears throat> making them think that uh, the, the British were secretly uh, going to invade a different part of the world than they invaded. And what happened was that the Germans um, they they uh, they sent a lot of they sent the major part of their artillery and troops into that area that they. That the, the, the that Britain wasn't actually planning to to go to. So anyway, they, they made a video called Garbo. And in in the video, that it shows this man after after the war, he went into hiding. This uh, Juan Garcia, and he he uh, started living in a remote part of Venezuela. He's Spanish by by nature, so he speaks the language. And he was in a re and he was tracked down. And uh, someone who, a Britisher who worked for the uh, United States. Department of State managed to somehow or other miraculously track him down. And then this guy knew the Duke of Edinburgh, the Queen's husband. So the, the, uh, the video shows Juan Garcia wandering around the, the tombs of the British soldiers who died in World War II. There's big crosses and there's about maybe 100 different people buried in that, in that uh, cemetery. There were, uh, you know, young people. They were soldiers. They were under 30 years old, most of them. So I, I feel kind of like that guy that, uh, I, you know, kind of an older guy. I'm 77 years old now. And, uh, you know, when, when um, I, I feel like I'm, I'm just, you know, I wasn't in New York. I wasn't in Brooklyn at the time of the purchase of the temple, at the time of the installation of the deities. So I just feel like, like, like he must have felt that, that uh, you know, that I have some sentiment for, 
for uh, the Brooklyn Temple and the deities. I've stayed there a few times uh, in the in that place, but I do feel a bit like like a relic, like a fossil, you know, because I, I, I have a, a bit of attachment to them. <laughs> but uh, you know that that uh, Juan Garcia, he he felt a little attachment. Uh, he came out of his hiding because he got an award when he when he was introduced to the Duke of Edinburgh. He, he be, that's when he became a member of the, the British Empire or, or, or Order of the British Empire, whatever it was. Uh, but I sort of feel like that, like I'm, I'm just just part, not really part of what uh, what happened in, in, in when the deities were installed. I think it was